Good day everyone, we are the group 3 and we are going to discuss about protozoa. To begin, let us define what protozoans are. So according to Jaeger in 1996, Protozoans are unicellular eukaryotes that have enclosed genetic material. They are different from other microorganisms such as bacteria because bacteria have no defined nucleus. In terms of their size, they are microscopic, of course, and most of the parasitic protozoa found in humans are known to be less than 50 micrometer. Protozoans also have complex internal structures that permit them to perform metabolic activities. So let's move into their nucleus. So there are two types of nucleus. The first one is vesicular nucleus and the other one is compact nucleus. Let us first focus on the vesicular nucleus. So, excluding the ciliates, vesicular nucleus containing chromatin are characterized to be concentrated peripherally or internally. So, in the vesicular nucleus, there is also a structure called endosome or karyosome, which is DNA negative. For compact nucleus, they are described to contain more chromatin and is more dense compared to the latter nucleus and this type of nucleus the compact nucleus plays a role in sexual reproduction of ciliophorans as mentioned earlier protozoans have complex internal structures and one of these is their mitochondria which allow them to perform aerobic respiration. One unique feature about their mitochondria is the tubular morphology of their cristae, which can be observed from the figure below. For their locomotion, protozoans are generally motile and are found widespread in aquatic habitats or even as pathogens of humans or of animals. They have either pseudopodia, cilia, or flagella which help them with their movement. So pseudopodia are blunt processes found in the cytoplasm and is included to be covered by the cell membrane. These blunt processes are classified into two, motile and non-motile. On the other hand, cilia and flagella are characterized by the presence of their basal body and an axial microtubule. Species belonging to protozoa have four types of feeding and they can be considered as photoautotrophic, heterotrophic, chemoheterotrophic, and saprozoic. For instance, in photoautotrophic microorganisms, they use chloroplasts, which can be seen on the green structures of the dinoflagellate in the figure. As you all know, these green structures function in harnessing light energy that can be converted into chemical energy. In amoebas, Phagocytosis, which is a mechanism of forming a food vacuole around a nutrition source such as solid food particle or bacteria, is also observed. The process of phagocytosis actually begins with the utilization of pseudopodia to engulf the food particle. This is then followed by its digestion of the material with the help of enzymes, the digested food particles are then released to the cytoplasm while the undigested remains are excreted by the organism. For their reproduction, they can either be asexual, similar to flagellates, 
sexual, like ciliophorans, or both, like apicomplexa. A sexual reproduction occurs through binary fission. And binary fission is the process wherein an organism duplicates its genetic material and then splits the body into two, resulting into two identical offsprings. So, there can be different planes of division. For example, in flagellates, it divides longitudinally, while in ciliates, it divides transversely. There is also another type of asexual reproduction called multiple fission, which involves two processes called schizogony and endopolygeny. In multiple fission, the rate of organelle and nuclei division is very fast and is accompanied after by cytokinesis. Schizogony results to a multinucleated cell called schizont, while endopolygeny is similar to the process of budding. Sexual reproduction, as mentioned earlier, is also observed in protozoans. Exhibited by the ciliophorans is the conjugation. So conjugation begins when the two cells join together and each of their micronuclei undergoes meiosis, which in turn results in the exchange of the resulting haploid nuclei, which finally forms the genetically new sets of the micronuclei for each cell. There is also another type of sexual reproduction called syngamy, which involves the union of the whole gametes, which later produces zygotes. So this is somehow different to the first type of sexual reproduction, which is the conjugation, in a manner that in conjugation, only a portion of the microorganism is involved in the reproduction, but in syngamy, it involves the whole cell for them to produce an offspring. Both modes of reproduction, the sexual and asexual, are exhibited by apicomplexa. This ability then allows the alternation of generation, which is only common to plants and invertebrates. I believe that I have mentioned this before from the previous slides, but I would just like to reiterate that protozoans are found in various places, especially in aquatic environments, including freshwater and oceans. They can also be found in places with rich moisture, such as soil. Moreover, you can also find protozoans inside the bodies of other organisms. In this part of the discussion, we would be learning how protozoans were identified and classified. And I think learning a bit of its history will best help us understand the way it is right now. So let's begin. Protozoa's history involves the father of microscopy, Anton van Leeuwenhoek. He is a Dutch scientist who was the first person to observe protozoa using the single lens microscope that he constructed. As you can see at the right side of the presentation is a replica of his invention. In addition to free-living protozoa, he described several parasitic species from animal and Giardia lamblia a flagellated parasitic microorganism from his own stools. Carl Theodor Ernst von Siebold was a German physiologist and zoologist. He was the one who recognized the unicellular nature of protozoa. He proposed that the bodies of protozoans, such as ciliates and amoeba, are consisted of single cells, similar to those from which the multicellular tissues of plants and animals were constructed. Siebold redefined protozoa to include only such unicellular forms, excluding all metazoa or animals. Until the middle of 20th century, protozoa were widely treated taxonomically as a mere subset of the kingdom Animalia, retaining their first animal definition from 150 years earlier since its first observation. 
Protozoa were thought to exhibit major characteristics typical of that kingdom, like being colorless, which means no photosynthetic pigments present, yet a number of chlorophyll-possessing algal groups were included in the phylum. Phagotrophic, which I believe was already explained a while ago, which means engulfing in order to feed oneself and being able to move independently. However, it is now abundantly clear that this classical definition of protozoa is at best misleading and incomplete, requiring considerable refinement. Ernst Haeckel was a German biologist who created a novel third kingdom, the Protista. The Protista contains the largely microscopic and unicellular organisms that he believed should no longer be assigned to the long-dominating pair of kingdoms containing the macroscopic and multicellular plants and animals. With the advancement of technology, especially in the field of light microscopy and related techniques of fixing and staining, morphological cellular characteristics were recognized. The use of electron microscopical approaches in cell biology further provided knowledge in protozoology and related fields. Protozoa has four major groups and the first is amoeboid. Amoeboid uses temporary projections, called pseudopods, to be able to move. These pseudopods also give them the ability to change its shape because it can move in any direction and engulf its food. When it comes to amoeboid's reproduction, it produces by fission or splitting in two. Some examples of amoeboids are pelomyxa found in stagnant freshwater ponds or slow-moving streams, and amoeba histolytica, a parasitic amoeboid that is responsible for amoebiasis, and radiolaria, which is non model that is why their needle-like pseudopods help them float since they drift along water currents. The second major group of protozoa is the flagellated group. Just like amoeboids with their pseudopods, the flagella of these protozoa are used for locomotion and sensation. Many of them have thin, firm pellicle or a coating of a jelly-like substance. Their reproduction could be asexual or sexual. When they reproduce asexually, they do it by longitudinal splitting. Flagellated protozoa are further taxonomically divided into two classes, namely Phytomastigophorea and Zoomastigophora. Phytomastigophorea, or phytoflagellate, has many common characteristics with the typical algae. Therefore, this class of flagellated protozoa leans more on the kingdom plantae. Considering all that, it may obtain nutrients by photosynthesis, by absorption through the body surface, or by ingestion of food particles. Examples of these are euglena, which can feed autotrophically and heterotrophically, chlamydomonas, which is a genus of green algae found in stagnant water and on damp soil, and cryptomonad, which is also like euglena, that is both autotroph and heterotroph. On the other hand, the second class of flagellated protozoa which is zoomastigophora, or also known as zooflagellate, could lean more on the kingdom animalia. This class exhibits a considerable variation in form and may be free-living, symbiotic, commensal, or parasitic in humans, other animals, and in certain plants. Examples of zooflagellates are chonoflagellates, which are considered to be the closest living relatives of animals hypermastigotes that are parasitic or symbiotic in the digestive systems of termites and cockroaches, and trichomonad, which can be found in the urogenital tract and in the oral cavity of humans. Actually, the recent classifications question the taxonomic usefulness of the term, because some zooflagellates have photosynthetic capabilities and some phytoflagellates have heterotrophic capabilities just like Euglena and Cryptomonad mentioned a while ago. Next in our list of the major groups of protozoa is the ciliated group. They have short, hair-like structures called cilia, 
used for movement and food gathering. Among all protozoan assemblages, ciliates are the most stable and perhaps circumscribed because they are considered to be the most evolved and complex group of protozoa. When it comes to their reproduction, they typically reproduce asexually through transverse binary fission. However, sexual exchanges by conjugation and autogamy, meaning the nuclear reorganization within an individual, occur as well. Their sexual reproduction does not always result in immediate increase in numbers, but conjugation is often followed by binary fission. Some ciliated protozoans are paramecium, which feeds on microorganisms like bacteria, algae, and yeasts, balantidium, the only ciliate known to be capable of infecting humans causing balantidiasis, and spirotrix, that are common throughout soil, freshwater, and marine environments. And finally, the last major group of protozoa in our list is sporozoa, which is also known as apicomplexa. Sporozoans are parasitic and lack contractile vacuoles and locomotor processes. This means that they are non-motile. They live within the body cavities or cells of almost every kind of animal, including other sporozoans. They feed by absorbing either dissolved food ingested by the host or the host's cytoplasm and bodily fluids. Their reproduction can be done sexually preceding spore formation or asexually by binary or multiple fission. Some examples of sporozoans are plasmodium, which causes malaria spread by infected mosquitoes, imeria, causing the disease coccidiosis in animals such as cattle, poultry, dogs, and cats, and isospora, which is responsible for the condition isosporiasis, causing an acute, non-bloody diarrhea in immunocompromised individuals. Now, we have your some representative organisms of protozoa. First, we have amoeba proteus. Amoeba proteus is a unicellular, colorless, large protozoan that belongs to the phylum Sarcodina. Amoeba proteus is found in freshwater environments or mo moist environments that are dominated by soil or plants. In terms of locomotion, this amoeba uses pseudopodia. Pseudopodia literally means false feet. The pseudopodia of an amoeba are not permanent. They are only formed when needed and they disappear after being used. Basically, the pseudopodia grants the microbe an ability to extend and contract into any possible shape. That is why amoeba has an ever-changing shape. In terms of importance, amoeba proteus plays an important role in maintaining a healthy soil ecosystem, mainly because it recycles the nutrients used by bacteria, and it keeps the bacteria population in check. Next, we have euglena species. Euglena are a cellular, freshwater water organisms under the phylum Sarcomastigophora. The genus Euglena comprises about a thousand species that vary in shape, size, and structural details. In terms of locomotion, Euglena moves around by using its flagella. The flagellum is located on the anterior end, and it twirls in such a way as to pull the cell through the water. Euglena species are important because they are indicators of ecological well-being mainly because they favor water that is rich in organic materials. Thus, they can be used to indicate the health of their environment. Third organism is Paramecium bursaria. Paramecium bursaria is a unicellular and sleeper-shaped organism found in freshwater environments. It is a part of a group of organisms known as ciliates that are under phylum ciliophora. As the name ciliate suggests, their bodies are covered in cilia. The cilia serves as the main structure for their movement. A paramecium propels itself by whiplash movements of the cilia that are arranged in tightly spaced rows around the outside of their body. In terms of importance, paramecium acts as cleaner in the ecosystem. It feeds on microorganisms like algae, bacteria, and other small organisms. Additionally, it also helps clean tiny particles of debris in water. 
The last representative organism of protozoa is Plasmodium falciparum. Plasmodium falciparum is a sporozoan that belongs to the phylum Ampicomplexa. It is characterized by being one-celled, parasitic, and spore-forming. Additionally, Plasmodium falciparum are elongated and crescent-shaped, by which they are sometimes identified. In terms of movement, Plasmodium falciparum does not have flagella, cilia, or pseudopodia. Rather, their primary mode of locomotion is through the use of gliding mechanisms. The gliding mechanisms use small static pyrocene motors. Basically, Plasmodium falciparum is a protozoan parasite of humans. They are the causative agent of malignant terminal malaria, or also known as tropical malaria, which is the most severe form of malaria. Now we will share to you recent discoveries and updates about the group Protozoa. One of the newly discovered species is the Coanoeca flexa, which belongs to the group of chonoflagellates that scientists claims shares a common ancestor with animals. This species was first discovered when researchers in Nicole King's lab looked through a microscope and saw sheets of cells clustered together in a pattern that resembled skin. Weirdly enough, the sheets flipped from a shallow cup shape into little ball-like structures and started swimming around. This new species appear more likely in the harsh environment of splash pools which are filled by the spray of crashing waves and pummeled by near constant wind. They also found out that C. flexa cells form sheets in which all the cells flagella point in the same direction, just like epithelial cells which make up skin and many tissues in animals. When the sheets curl up into a ball with the flagella pointing outward, the ball swims quickly by waving the tail-like structures. Or the sheet can flip into a cup shape by unfolding and then curling in the opposite direction in such a way that all the flagella face inside. A series of experiments revealed that the organism also reacts to light using a light-sensing protein and other molecules, some of which C. flexa must obtain from the, from the bacteria they eat. The precise mechanism for the flip is that the cells simultaneously flare their colors into a cone shape, bending the sheet of cells and causing a contraction similar to that of an animal's muscle. Four new species of Xenophyophores were found in the Clarion Clipper Zone near Hawaii, three miles below the surface of the Pacific Ocean. The Xenophyophores are very large, single-celled organisms living on the seafloor that build skeletons up to 4 inches long around themselves. The four newly discovered species were named as Muanamina semicircularis, Abyssalia foliformis, Abyssalia spherica, and Samina tenui. Monamina semicircularis was found on the bottom of the seafloor inside a fan up to 3 inches long. Abyssalia foliformis, on the other hand, was found inside a flat, leaf-shaped structure, and Abyssalia sperica was found inside a perfect spear. Both species were built out of pieces of sponge. The fourth species identified was Samina tenui, which was found in a delicate, thin, and plate-like structure. The discovery of these species have increased the number of described Xenophyophores in the Clarion Clipperton zone to 17, 22% of the global total for this group, with many more known but still undescribed. The discovery of the four new species of Xenophyophores also led to the formation of two new genera, namely Moanamina and Abyssalia. Moanamina is named after Moana, the Hawaiian term for ocean, while Abyssalia is a Latin word that means abyssal, which simply refers to the location where these species were found. Moanamina's characteristics are the following. They are test flattened, fan-shaped, and supported on short basal stalk. They are also composed largely of radiolarians, forming fairly homogeneous structure and without clearly defined surface layer. Granular strands are brownish, branching frequently, 
and generally between 50 to 100 micrometers in diameter. Their stercomere are not arranged in any obvious pattern. In terms of test morphology, Muanamina resembles stock species assigned to the genus Samina. However, it displays very little differentiation between the surface and internal Senophyi, whereas Samina species are clearly distinguished by having a well-defined test wall and relatively sparse internal Senophyi. Species in Abyssalia are test-free or attached, flattened or spherical, composed of an undifferentiated three-dimensional meshwork of sponge spicules with no distinct surface layer or internal lumen. Interior structures are clearly visible within at least the outer part of the structure. Stercomata form loose aggregations that occupy much of space between spicules but are easily washed out in preserved specimens. They also have granular tube with relatively thick organic wall and close inside the plasm and forming pale yellowish branching system weaving between spicules. In terms of morphology, Abyssalia appears closest to Sameta, which is a genera that includes four species with spherical or flattened test that incorporate sponge spicules exclusively so in P. erythrocytomorpha. The morphology and phylogeny of the novel ciliate Nexella paralucida collected from Shanghai, China has been investigated using live observation and silver staining methods by Liao et al. Nexella paralucida can be distinguished from its cogeners based on its two short nasolate organelles, fusiform trichocyst, 37 to 49 somatic kinetes, and 16 nematodesmal rods. Phylogenetic analysis shows that Nexella is most closely related to Nasula sp and is located within the monophyletic clade of the family Nasulidae. Along with Nexella paralucida, the novel ciliate Arcanistutura chongmingensis was also investigated. The genera Arcanistutura can be easily distinguished from related genera by its inconspicuous oblique anterior suture. Furthermore, Arcanistura chongmiensis sp is mainly recognized by its elongated body with a tail-like posterior end, 25 to 33 somatic kinetes, and 4 to 11 excretory pores. Phylogenetic analysis shows that Arcanistura forms a sister clade to other cinnamonid genera, namely Chylodontopsis, Orthodonella, and Sosterodesis. Common human diseases caused by protozoans Most protist diseases in humans are caused by protozoa. This includes amoebiasis and malaria. Amoebiasis, also known as amoebic dysentery, is a parasitic infection of the intestines. This disease causes about 100,000 human deaths globally each year. It is caused by a single-celled parasitic protozoan called Entamoeba histolytica. Amoebiasis can be acquired through ingestion of the matured cysts of E. histolytica through food, water, or direct contact with infected feces. Anal sex, oral anal sex, and colonic irrigation can also transmit this disease to another person. Well, after ingestion, the cyst release the invasive form of the E. histolytica called trophozoite in the ileum. They can burrow into the intestinal walls, leading to tissue destruction and diarrhea. Some of the newly formed cysts stay within the human body and multiply, while others get excreted with the feces to look for new hosts. Some people carry the parasite or cysts without having symptoms, but they can still pass the disease on to other people. Symptoms usually start with abdominal pain that eventually develops into loose bowel movements. Fever Nausea, loss of appetite, and bloody stools may also be experienced by the infected person. Next, we have malaria. In humans, malaria is brought about by plasmodium. The parasite is only carried by the female Anopheles mosquito, which can be infected with plasmodium during blood feeding on infected humans. As the infected Anopheles mosquito feeds on the uninfected human, the sporozoids of the plasmodium enter the bloodstream and travel to the liver. 
Upon maturation, they leave the liver and infect the red blood cells, destroying them. They continue the cycle by releasing daughter parasites called merozoites that invade other red blood cells. Among all types of malaria, the most severe is the one that is caused by the species Plasmodium falciparum.